Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Carpenter. Uh, I'd like to speak to the idea that uh, Jesus and the Father are both represented eternally in heaven. And uh, I'd like to read uh, four, four verses of the scripture and also ask you to talk about the one, uh, and I'm not that familiar with it, but it's where I believe David is talking about the Messiah, and he says something to the effect of my Lord and his Lord. And I think you know the one I'm referring to. And the other one is found in uh, Corinthians chapter 12, or I'm sorry, chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until God has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been made, everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. all right. that, uh, I think superficially, that's probably a difficult scripture for both the Trinitarian and Oneness view. Superficially, the Jehovah's Witnesses would like that because it makes the Son, if the Son is distinct, the Son is subordinate. But I think if you tie the other passage, which is Psalm 110, uh, it's talking about the Messiah to come, that Jehovah is going to uh, exalt the Messiah and put all enemies under his feet. And this is talking about the human king to come, who is, we know from the rest of Scripture, God manifests in the flesh. But nevertheless, it's important to see that. So in 1 Corinthians 15, we see what's happening. Right now, we're in the kingdom of the Son. Uh, we're being uh, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The messianic uh, promise is being fulfilled. But the purpose is to one day bring us back to the eternal state. One day, there will need, be no more need for redemption. There will be no ongoing sin. But everything will be established according to God's eternal plan, and God will simply be what he was from the beginning. While Jesus will always be God manifested in flesh in a human body, he will no longer be the media, act in the mediatorial role. There will be no more need for that. So right now we're in the kingdom of the Son, the age of mediation and redemption culminating in the last judgment. But in the age to come, it won't be the kingdom of the Son. It will simply be the kingdom of God as it was before. Now, if you look at that as one person and another person, then the son becomes subordinate to the other person, contrary to the classical doctrine of the Trinity. But if you look at it from my point of view, as I just explained, through the role of mediation, then it subordinates that role back into the eternal identity of God. And that corresponds with Ephesians 5, 26, where it says that Jesus will present the church to himself, not to someone else. So in 1 Corinthians, the son presents the kingdom to the Father. In uh, Ephesians, Jesus presents the church to himself. It's two different ways of describing the th same thing, but the end result is one God fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And remember Revelation 22, God and the Lamb, not as two persons on two thrones, not as two persons sitting on uh, one on each other on one throne, but one person on one throne, both God and the Lamb at the same time. And I think that summarizes that passage. Dr. Carpenter. Yeah, I think that uh, what you have is uh, God dealing and working with his son. And we're talking about uh, redemption. And we're talking about God and the son in relationship to humanity and establishing his people and establishing the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus had the opportunity when he was tempted by the devil uh, to uh, give in to the devil and get his kingdom then in an easy way, in a, in a wrong way. But he said, no, I will not do that. I will be the true son of God, the true God-man, 
even though I could turn these stones into bread, and submit myself, and I will take the way of the suffering servant. And that's the God-man doing that. And so, whenever we see God completing things and putting all things under the feet of Jesus, the Son, and we, and we see uh, uh, so that God can be all in all, the triune God can be all in all, then that's what we're talking about and not the, some eternal uh, dimension of God outside of the biblical story of God rescuing and redeeming and establishing that which he has always intended to do. And so, the subordinationism that might be seen there by some is not, in fact, there in the Godhead. God is simply completing and giving to Jesus the full honor and glory and power that he has promised him. It almost reminds you of, well, it does remind you of, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, where God gives to that being, the Son of Man, an eternal kingdom. I can tell you, you can go back into ancient Near Eastern history and go to Ur-3, one of the early uh, cities that were uh, from, the city from which uh, Abraham came, and that city fell. And there was a lament for that city. But it was inter it's interesting what the text says, it was time for that city to fall. The kingdoms of this world fall. Uh, not so, according to Daniel, because that Son of Man gets a kingdom that will last forever. So, seen in that light, I don't see any uh, challenge or problem for the imminent Godhead that we're talking about. We're talking about the economic Godhead. The next question.